In-depth football coverage from The Athletic is now just £1 per week. See the link in the description to sign up today. The Pep Guardiola era at Barcelona had many peaks, but none higher than the Champions League final win over Manchester United in 2011, when his team gave a performance that charmed the watching world. The victory was Guardiola's signature triumph, and this is its story. Perhaps the hardest earned trophy, and on reflection, just as characteristic of his side's durability as it was their class. The 2010-11 season was a grind. On and sometimes off the pitch, and after back-to-back -back La Liga titles, it would begin with a significant change. Rafael Marquez and Thierry Henry departed for MLS in the summer of 2010, and losses were cut on Zlatan Ibrahimovic, who departed to AC Milan on loan, and Dmitry Chagrinsky, who returned to the Ukraine, plus Yaya Torre, who was also sold to Manchester City. Now, arriving in their place to garnish the side's La Masia core were prolific goal scorer David Villa and combative international midfielder Javier Mascherano, who took a significant pay cut to join from Liverpool. Mascherano would be converted into an outstanding centre-half, key during a season in which Puyol would suffer continuously with a knee injury. But in Villa, however, Barcelona captured a player that they'd coveted for a long time, but also, crucially, a hugely talented all-round forward with the necessary humility to defer to both Guardiola's system and the positional and tactical role of Lionel Messi. It was a signing that completed an already excellent side, putting it in perfect harmony. Beginning with Victor Valdez, the extra outfielder who reveled in having the ball at his feet. Then Puyol, Piquet and often Mascherano, the centre-halves who could receive passes anywhere in the defensive third under any pressure before pushing possession up the alleys. Or Eric Abidal and Dani Alves, whose sharp contrasts complemented each other perfectly. Further forward, Guardiola had assembled maybe the most press-resistant midfield the sport had ever seen. Deep-lying pivot Sergio Busquets was the cultured enforcer, happy to screen or even drop into the defence, but with the skill and sharp passing range to cut the lines ahead of him. Busquets was the failsafe. His emergence at Barcelona allowed Xavi to be pushed further up the field, and in turn Iniesta to be moved even higher and closer to a forward line, which dovetailed around perhaps the greatest player of all time. A forward line that, by the end of the season, would have scored 83 goals in the league and Champions League combined. But despite that, Barcelona's start in Europe was still underwhelming. They emerged from their group undefeated, but only after falling behind against Ruben Kazan and being held in Denmark by a hard-running FC Copenhagen side, in a game which ended with an angry confrontation between Guardiola and opposing manager Stola Solbakken. They would also suffer a scare in the round of 16 after a wasteful performance against Arsenal left them chasing a 2-1 deficit. Eventually overwhelming the English side in the second leg, they went on to dismantle Shakhtar Donetsk in the quarter-final, setting the scene for what would become the season's centrepiece and one of the most notorious episodes in their rivalry with Real Madrid, then under the new management of Jose Mourinho. By the start of that spring, Barcelona was suffering. Since the European Championship of 2008, the Spanish contingent had been involved in the Confederations Cup of 2009 and the World Cup triumph of 2010. For the majority, it had been three years of continuous football without a proper break, and it was starting to show. Xavi would suffer with Achilles tendon problems throughout 2011, and after his knee injury in January, Puyol would play in just four more games, three of them against Real Madrid out of necessity. Added to which, in an interview with The Guardian's Sid Lowe, Andres Iniesta spoke of the great pressures that he felt during that period of his career, and difficult, uncomfortable moments that were only chased away by World Cup success in 2010. By 2010-11, he personally had rebounded, but he was describing an emotional toll that success takes, and the resilience required to maintain it. And of course, much more seriously, it was announced in March 2011 that a tumour had been discovered in Eric Abidal's liver, and that the French fullback needed immediate surgery. Miraculously, he would return to play before the end of the season, even starting the game at Wembley. But it was a heavy emotional blow. Thank you. 
Between the 16th of April and the 3rd of May that year, Barcelona would face Mourinho's Real Madrid in four different games. Once in the league, once in the final of the Copa del Rey, and twice across the two legs of the Champions League semi-final. It was a sequence which helped crystallise the binary relationship between Guardiola and Mourinho, and the heat from those fixtures lasts to this day. You see, back in 2008, when then-Barcelona president Joan Laporte was searching for Rijgaard's successor, Mourinho had been a strong candidate for the job that was eventually given to Guardiola. And so, when Florentino Perez brought him to Real Madrid, specifically in response to Barcelona's ascendancy, the Portuguese carried that rejection into an already acrid rivalry. Which of course became nastier after Barcelona inflicted a 5-0 Clasico defeat in November. But the real tone was set by the games that followed. A 1-1 draw in the league, and a niggly nasty Copa del Rey final which Cristiano Ronaldo eventually won with a brilliant towering header. And that match at Lemestia left a legacy, in friendships strained by its combative nature, in the constant haranguing of officials, and then in the rising bile which would spill out across the media. It began with Guardiola referencing the correct decision to disallow a Pedro goal, which was inflamed when somewhat inevitably, in the press conference held the night before their next meeting in the first leg of the semi-final, Mourinho retaliated with a mischievous diatribe claiming that his opponent was accustomed to referees favouring Barcelona. Unusually, Guardiola answered. In this particular press room, he's the fucking boss. The big fucking chief, he said, before sending up Mourinho's press room theatrics with a terse, steel-tongued rebuttal which, according to journalist Graham Hunter, sent delighted text messages pinging between his players and earned him a standing ovation upon his return to the team hotel. The year before, when his Inter Milan had defeated Barcelona, Mourinho had successfully built what he referred to as a prison around Leo Messi, minimising his effect from the deeper false nine role. He tried the same trick again, constructing a midfield repurposed of Lasana Diara, Xabi Alonso and the repurposed centre-half Pepe. He also ordered that the Bernabeu's grass be allowed to grow to 3 centimetres, three times longer than the Camp Nou's 1 centimetre, and for it not to be watered before kickoff, each an age-old attempt to slow the circulation of the ball. It was a negative tactic and ultimately a negative performance. The prison around Lionel Messi wouldn't hold either, particularly after Pepe received a 61st-minute red card for a reckless challenge on Alves. The door sprung open and Messi took over, scoring first at the near post and then, with three minutes left, with one of the great goals of the era, putting the tie all but out of reach. Mourinho had been raging since Pepe's dismissal. He'd also been sent to the stands in its aftermath. Barcelona substitute Pinto was dismissed from the bench too after a spiteful confrontation between the two teams at half-time. It was a poisonous night of football, full of cheating and hostility, and inevitably both clubs were subsequently charged by UEFA. Barcelona would advance in the second leg with a 1-1 draw that was relatively drama-free, but it would still end a notorious sequence of games. Far from passion plays illuminated by the world's best players, these were classicos that had been endured and which had left anyone who experienced them rubbed raw. Wembley was the balm. It was a catharsis which occurred in a special place for Barcelona. The club had won their first European Cup in North London in 1992 and Johan Cruyff had won his first as a player with Ajax in 1971. And the performance was fitting, containing all the side's familiar hallmarks. The carousel-like ball circulation, which left Manchester United constantly outnumbered in the middle of the pitch and chasing players who had already moved. And the goals, which described the technicolour of Barcelona's football. The mesmerising Xavi-Pedro combination for the first, Messi's thrusting, transfixing brilliance for the second, and finally Villa's cultured third, which put a dizzied and beaten United away for good. And that night would of course provide one final lasting image, as Guardiola led his side up to the royal box. Puyol, a very late substitute, handed the captain's armband to Eric Abidal, who had started the game having made his return in the semi-final. Two and a half months after his diagnosis, he emerged out onto the gallery to receive the European Cup, before lifting it to an enormous roar from the Barcelona end. Tifo is delighted to be able to offer full access to The Athletic now for just £1 per week. 
Read in-depth coverage of your favourite teams across 10 different sports, provided by some of the best sports journalists in the world. Follow the stories that you care about with closer access and intelligent takes. Whether it's sports news, tactics or finances, you'll find it all on The Athletic, alongside a host of brilliant podcasts dedicated to different teams. So, see the link in the description now. Thanks for supporting TiVo and of course watching today's video.